I am Janet Lochsterman, the Chair of Biological Sciences, and I'm very excited to be um, introducing our very first research roundup uh, that we're going to get to see lots of presentations from our wonderful undergraduates being mentored by our fantastic faculty and graduate students. And without further ado, I would like to introduce one of those fa fabulous graduate students, Karina Sanchez, a master's student, and also winner of the ISU three-minute thesis competition, and I believe third, took third place in state as well. So take it over, Karina. And I would ask everyone to please make sure you mute your microphone. Thank you, Dr. Lockstrom, for the introduction. I'm really excited to be involved in this event and see everyone's talks. But before we get started, I just wanted to quickly go over the structure of how we'll have people present and the time limits. So first, I would just like to again remind everyone to mute their microphones throughout the talk so that the person who's supposed to be talking can be heard without any background noise. And then to start each talk, I'll ask the scheduled presenter to share their screen, then I'll introduce them and begin the timer. Presenters will have three minutes to give their talk, and I'll give them a 20 second warning by using the raise hand emoji. And then at the three minute mark, I'll chime in and let you know that we've reached our time limit and that we'll have to give the judges a minute or two to ask any questions that they have and finalize their scores. If they don't have any questions, we will have some time to take some quick questions from the audience. Um, and then once the judges have finalized their scores, we'll move on to the next presenter. If the audience has any in-depth questions that might take a little bit more than the one or two minutes we'll have at the end of each talk, we'll have a break specifically for questions and answers um, once all the presentations are done. And to keep the event on track with our scheduled times, we ask that the audience save those longer questions for that Q&A section. And as a reminder, if your Zoom is not updated, you may not be able to join that Q&A session, which is gonna be in the form of a breakout room. And if you haven't used breakout rooms before, they're sort of smaller sessions where people who are attending the Zoom meeting get put into different rooms of smaller groups. Lastly, we'll have a couple of five minute breaks at 4.40 p.m. and at 5.15 p.m. Okay. With that being said, I think we're ready to get started. So first, can I ask Catherine to please share her screen? Can everyone see that all right? Yes, I can see your screen. Excellent. Okay, first up is Catherine West, whose talk is titled, Using RT-PCR to Test Competency of MASK-1-3 Targeting Morpholinos in X Labius embryos. Catherine, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes. Okay, I'm going to start it now. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine West, and I have been working in Dr. Ray's lab for the last two semesters. My overarching project has been observing how the absence of the proteins MASP1 and MASP3 affect the development of African clawed frog embryos. The role that these two proteins play in embryonic development is currently unknown, so the question of my research has been, what roles do the proteins MASP1 and MASP3 have in embryonic development? In order to observe embryos that have reduced MASP1 and MASP3 protein expression, our lab injects morpholinos into early embryos. Now, morpholinos are short nucleotide sequences that disrupt mRNA splicing events, which in turn create non-functional proteins. This diagram here shows the genomic organization of the MASP1-3 gene in Xenopus, with each box representing its own individual exon. The two proteins that I am observing are alternative splice products of the same gene. Both proteins have a shared domain of exons 1 through 10, and then MASP3 is formed by having a continuation of exon 11, which ends in a stop code on that present, prevents the mRNA from this next sequence from being included in the protein. The second protein I'm looking at is MASP3, which still contains this shared domain of MASP1 through 10, but an alternative splicing event occurs that causes exon 11 to be excluded 
and exons 12 to 17 instead to be present in the mRNA. There are two morpholinos I've been working with in Dr. Ray's lab. The first is listed here as morpholino 2. And this morpholino causes the spliceosome to skip over exon 11, which causes no MASP3 protein to be made. The second morpholino I have been working with is morpholino 3, which is shown here. And this morpholino causes intron 12, which occurs here, to be retained in the mRNA, which results in non-functional MASP1 proteins being made. My work this semester has been focused on using RT-PCR to test if morpholino 2 and 3 are functioning correctly. Because these two morpholinos affect mRNA splicing, then changes in the mRNA products should be able to be observed through RT-PCR. I extracted mRNA from ex slavis embryos that had been injected with morpholinos and used reverse transcriptase to form cDNA from these sequences. I then used this cDNA for my RT-PCR reactions. And the primers used in those reactions are shown here with yellow arrows and are specifically in regions of the morpholino targeting. The primers I'm using for morpholino 2 are still being optimized, but I've had success with morpholino 3. You can see here that I had a band that is about 100 nucleotides longer than a second one in my PCR, which is the length of the intron, which means that through my work this semester, I was able to prove that morpholino 3 does disrupt the normal splicing of MASP1. Thank you. Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you for being the first person to give your talk. Yes, woo! <laughs> okay, do the judges have any questions at this time? Uh, we do not have any questions, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Then, if anyone from the audience has any questions, we could take those right now. I don't see any questions in the chat. Well, I forgot to mention that Catherine's talk is the only microbiology topic we have today. So that is really exciting. Um, and then the next section is going to be integrative organismal biology. While we are waiting for the judges, can I please have Jason load up his screen? Does that look good? Ready, the judges are done. Thank you. Perfect. Next, I'd like to introduce Jason Christensen, whose talk is titled Stuff in a Bucket, the Effect of Confinement Stress on Cortisol Levels in Brook Sprouts. Jason, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes. All right, I'm going to start it right now. So, uh, my name is Jason Christensen, and like Karina said, I'm looking at the um, impact of confinement stress on cortisol levels in brook trout. Today, I will be presenting our findings from this project. So I'm sure everybody here has felt stress before. And like us, animals are impacted by stress the same way we are. Um, so what controls this stress? Well, in humans and other organisms and brook trout, we uh, are controlled by cortisol uh, is the primary hormone that initiates the stress response. So the purpose of the experiment is to look at levels of stress experiment or experienced by brook trout in a confined space. The cortisol levels are measured in three ways. We looked at waterborne levels, plasma levels, and head kidney levels at different time points. So, maybe. So, like I mentioned above, we have a different, or we had a confined space of 350 milliliters uh, for 3, 5, 15, 30, and 60 minutes. So, fish are constantly exuding hormones into the water around them. So, we took the waterborne cortisol measured from the buckets that they were in during this time. Um, as you can see, there is a increase of cortisol levels over a three, five, and 15 minute period, as well as a five, 15, 30, and 60 minute period. Um, the same pattern is also visible on the plasma hormones that we could see an increase from three, five, 15, and 30, as well as five, 15, 30, and 60. So what do we see in the head kidney? 
Well, in the head kidney, we didn't really see any increase over the time points, and this is probably due to cortisol being synthesized and immediately sent out through the body, and there wasn't enough time for cortisol to build up in the kidneys or the head kidney. So the sex of the fish were determined post hoc. We noticed a difference in the fork length and mass with the males being drastically um, distributed wider than the females, but they were overall bigger. We also found that there was a difference between the rate of cortisol exuded from the brook trout between the males and females. Per minute, the females had a greater release of, hor or of cortisol compared to the males despite being generally smaller. So what does this mean? Because of the parallels between the waterborne hormones and plasma hormones, there may be implications to look at waterborne hormones instead of plasma hormones. This would be a less invasive uh, way of doing it. Also, we found detectable levels at three minutes and so that you could take other hormone samples without being impacted by cortisol. And finally, there's a difference in the rate of release of cortisol between the sexes, suggesting early life confinement can lead to sex differences in stress response. This may have important consequences on reproductive success. Thank you. Thank you, Kathan. Nicely done. Do we have any questions from the judges? No questions from us. Thanks. Okay. And then we have a minute or two to take any questions from the audience again. If anyone has any, looks like. I have a question. This is Colton. I can hear you. Hi. Yeah, that's very interesting work. Um, what do you speculate might be the root of the difference in the stress response uh, between males and females? Any ideas along those lines? I'm not sure. That's a very good question. I, I don't know. That's something that we've kind of found out that wasn't part of what we were looking at. That was kind of came up in as we were looking through the data. So we're kind we're not quite sure at this point. Right, yeah, there are um, kind of, there are a lot of actual examples now, a growing number of examples of ways in which fish, females and males differ uh, in terms of their behavior and ecology as well as physiology. So this is this could be an interesting uh, addition to that. Mm. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Um, so would this um, correlate or could you, by studying these effects in fish, would it be something that you could and um, relate to or potentially look at for what um, sociologists look at with childhood trauma? Yeah, would that's actually a great question. So a lot like being raised in these smaller uh, confined spaces and experiencing stress every single day, it will lead to lots of problems when they grow up like able to like there's some papers on um, brown and brook trout that stress has a smaller uh, egg size and other things like that and smaller gonad size in the males. So being exposed to this early can cause a lot of problems later. Thank you. The uh, judges have completed their scoring. Thanks. Thank you, judges. Okay, perfect. Then I will ask Maya to please share her screen now. I'd now like to introduce Maya Elliott, whose talk is titled, Coming Out of the Last Ice Age, fossils and cave sediments. Maya, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes, I am. Okay. It sounds like your volume is down a little bit. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you, but it's very quiet. Is that just my end? It's really quiet for us too in the judging room. If we can uh, increase the volume a bit,
upgrade. I don't know how to do that. Great. Right. Is that better? It's, it's still pretty quiet. I wonder if we could potentially switch the order a little bit, if that's okay with everyone, to give you a minute to increase the volume. Yeah, that's okay. Um, let's just keep it as it is and we'll adjust. We'll stay okay. closer to the speaker. But yeah, we're good. Let's 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 do it. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. I'll try and All right. I will start the timer now. All right. So my name is Maya and this semester I've been a CPI in Dr. P. Cook's paleontology lab in the museum. What um, me and my fellow CPIs have been doing is sorting through cave sediments this semester. So um, this cave, this cave is um, in Owyhee County. Um, it's called Grasshopper Cave Site. And um, as you can see there, it's in the southwest corner of the state. And um, we know that the fossils we find here are going to capture the transition from the Pleistocene or the Ice Age, which is 2.5 million years ago, to 11,000 years ago to the Holocene, which is the age we're actually in right now, which is 11,000 years ago to the present. So um, we're actually working on getting some more specific ages on this, so that is to come. And the reason that we would excavate cave sediments is because caves are very good at preserving fossils. Now out in the open, caves have to do, you know, there's weather and there are other animals that might come and scavenge and so things are less likely to fossilize, whereas in a cave, um, things are more likely to fossilize because of the protection the cave offers. Now, um, my fellow CPIs and I would really just take a handful of sediments at a time, put it in our little box, and go through her tweezers and see what fossils we could find. Now, this was very time consuming, but it was very rewarding because we were able to find a lot of these micro fossils. And I was also able to identify some of them, and here are my favorites. Um, so these top pictures are of the meadow mole, this little mouse that's around here, and here are its teeth. Now the interesting thing about these rodent teeth are that each has a specific ridge pattern that is um, only its species has. So I was able to identify these teeth by taking the um, an already identified meadow mole skull and comparing it to the teeth underneath the microscope. And um, that was, you know, made it a lot easier to identify them. Now in the bottom left, we have the Colombian ground squirrel. I found two teeth and a toe for it. And um, you can see its teeth is a lot more like ours with a root. And um, that is because it is omnivorous compared to the completely herbivorous meadow bull. Now, um, both the ground squirrel and the meadow bull would be common prey items in this area. So they have a lot of good reasons to be like hiding in a cave, which is why we probably found them there. Um, now, this last one here is the coyote, and this is just one of its incisors. And we wouldn't have, um, we haven't found a lot of carnivores yet, at least. And that's mostly because they're going to have bigger bones, and um, researchers are going to be able to pick them up while they're, you know, going through. Whereas we get to find the smaller micro fossils and um, deal with kind of the harder part. And so um, we hope that as we keep identifying species that we can learn more about this ecosystem in the transition from the Ice Age to the Holocene. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Very neat talk. And I will ask the judges really quick if they have any questions. We're good, thank you. Now I can open it up to the audience if the audience has any questions. And Maya, I have a question for you. Um, I'm curious how, like, how much sediment do you have to look through um, in order to find these fo these uh, fossils? Um, I'd say. So I, in like every about handful, we have maybe like, there's one fossil for at least every two handfuls, I'd say, but we have boxes and boxes of sediment from this cave site. We're going to be busy for a very long time. 
we're going to get a lot of information on this. And so it doesn't take very long to find a fossil. Um, it can take a while to find a good one, though. Does that answer cool. your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Can I have a follow-up question? Hi, um, Maya. I was just curious if you guys were going to be looking at like the sediment, like the carbon and nitrogen and isotope data. I'm sure, uh, I don't know if Bruce is on um, this chat, but it seems like that's a really interesting um, cave identification. Um, so actually, we do have a grad student looking at the isotopes in the fossils right now. It's not something I'm involved in, but we are going to be able to get that data soon. Awesome. Hey Maya, what do you do with the fossils that you can't identify? Um, they kind of end up staying in the collections for a long time and they're, they stay there <laughs> mostly, yeah. Alrighty, the judges have completed their scoring. Thank you. Can I please have you share your screen? Yes, ma'am. You can figure out how to present. Okay. that button. Awesome. Perfect. Next, I'd like to introduce Ruth Andrews, whose talk is titled Stable Isotope Analysis of Aquatic Food Webs in Willowa Lake, Oregon. Are you ready for me to start the timer, Ruth? I am. Start starting it now. <laughs> okay, so um, my research right now is looking at Willowa Lake in Oregon, uh, which is a large glacial, glacial lake located in northeastern Oregon. Um, if you look at the map, over here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, I assume you can. We've got the border with the Columbia River here, kind of along this edge. And then uh, down here is Oregon. And here's Northeastern Oregon is where Willowa Lake is located. So about a hundred years ago, um, a dam was built that blocked access to Willowa Lake to um, Anadromous Pacific Sockeye Salmon. And since then, eight other dams have been built on the Columbian Snake River. So uh, there's currently a rehabilitation project underway that uh, would provide structures that would allow fish to pass through these dams. Um, and we're looking at the uh, isotopes in the fish that are currently in the lake to determine how uh, this reintroduction of salmon might affect the lake's food web. So I kind of inherited this project. Uh, right now we only have the 2019 samples process, which is 54 samples from five different fish species. But we are currently working on the 2020 sample set. Uh, the carbon and nitrogen isotope levels in these fish samples can indicate where they fit in the lake's food web. So the carbon 13 is an indicator of where the fish are feeding, like what habitat within the lake. And the nitrogen 15 is an indicator of trophic level. So every sample set we have kind of creates a clearer picture of what this like food web looks like. And so uh, in order to uh, manage the wildlife and make sure that it's safe to introduce the salmon to the lake, uh, we have to have a pretty clear picture of that food web. So it's still underway, but that's what we're working on right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I will pass this off to the judges if they have any questions now. Uh, we're good. We'll give it to the audience. Thanks. And it looks like Dr. Baxter has a question. Hi, uh, yeah, this is a really interesting project. Um, I'm looking at your plot there of the, the isotope, stable isotope data um, for fish from Wallawa Lake. 
And I'm wondering, what do you think about why there's such a large spread in values um, for uh, kokanee, for example, I assume that's kokanee in July. So there's a large spread in their in their Dell 15 value and 15 values, and there's a large spread along the carbon axis, you know, for what I assume are the suckers. Uh, any ideas about what why those are spread out so much? Uh, we have identified, especially the suckers, uh, that those we're, we're not sure whether that is actually correct or maybe there was a mistake there. So that's why we're currently trying to get more data and more points so we can check and see if that's right or not. Right. I mean, it, if it were right, it might mean that that some suckers are doing very different things in the food web than others, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> similarly with those kokanee, that some of them are feeding at much higher trophic levels than others. It looks, it seemed like. Were those fishes of different sizes and life stages or were they all um, adult kokanee? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I've I recently kind of inherited this project and have been trying to get up to speed on it. But um, we are looking a little bit at the how the what month of the year it is can affect uh, the different uh, how those values come out. So mm -hmm. we're we're not entirely sure yet, but hopefully more data in the future will help form a clearer picture. Great, very interesting. Uh, the judges are done, but we still have some time if anybody wanted to squeeze in a final question, but we're good to go. Okay, thank you. Yes, it looks like we're making good time. Um, okay, I will have Miriam begin to share her screen. All right, can everybody see that? Yes. All right. Perfect. I'd now like to introduce Miriam Weeks, whose talk is titled Effects of Fire on Sea Bank Persistence in Sea Fresh Stuff. Hello, Stephanie. Oh, thank um, you. And I would just like to remind everyone to mute their microphones, please. Are you ready to begin? I am. All right, I will start the timer right now. Have you ever seen a volunteer plant in your garden or flower bed? Have you ever wondered how old the seed is or when the original plant grew there? An understanding of the seed bank can help us with these questions. A seed bank is comprised of the viable seeds within the soil that persist from year to year. These help reestablish above ground communities after a disturbance or in the case of extinction. The Barton Road Research Site experienced an accidental fire in August of 2020. This became an opportunity for research, even though Barton had years of experiments that went up in smoke. Learning how fire affects these seeds is important in a world with increasing fire cycles because fire affects both plants and humans. You can see on the left is a picture of Barton that was burnt, and then on the right is in the unburned area. I had two hypotheses with my research. Hypothesis number one, fire had a greater effect on more shallow soil strata. Hypothesis number two, the shallow strata will have greater abundances of invasive plant seeds than native plant seeds. Represented here is a diagram of how I collected my samples. Four samples were taken, two in the undershrub area and two in the inner space to try and capture the heterogeneity of the landscape. Shrub bases were still evident in the burned area. These samples were homogenized, air dried, and sipped. The, so the soil was divided and spread over potting soil. Seedlings were removed weekly and representative species were grown and identified. Not all were able to be identified, some remained unknown. A seedling appendix was created to help future researchers at Barton and in this ecosystem. 
On the left is a graph of the unburned area, representative of the expected composition of the seed bank before the fire. This addresses in part my second hypothesis. The native and non-native plants are disproportionate in the A strata. However, they balance out in the B strata, even though there are fewer seedlings. The graph on the right addresses hypothesis number one. This graph shows how the fire affected the species richness in the most shallow strata. Strata B shows, again, more balance. Fire had the strongest effect on the shallow strata. This research is important because when we understand what's in the seed bank and how it's affected, we can help ecosystems recover. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. Really nice talk. I will check in with the judges and see if they have any questions now. We're good. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. And now we can open it up to the audience if they have any questions as well. Hi, Miriam. This is Keith Reinhardt. I was, wondering, um, I was wondering off the top of your head, what species were you finding both? I, I don't care about native or non-native. I just want to know what you were finding out there. I found a lot of cheatgrass, a lot of Lactuca cereola, which is a prickly lettuce. Um, this is Cimbrium altissimum, which is a mustard. Both of those are invasive. I did find a few of the native plants that made me very happy. I found two little sagebrush seedlings. They were not the big sagebrush, which I really hoped for but they were the cut tip sage or the Artesima tri tripartita. So that was exciting. So I did find a wide variety, but a lot of the invasive things. Great, thank you. No problem. I have, I have a follow-up question, Miriam. Um, great, okay. Great talk. When you said you were you were hoping for to find big sagebrush, why was it that you were hoping to find the the big sagebrush? One of the reasons I was hoping to find the big sagebrush is because it is in the landscape out there. Um, it's and it's one of the key things in our ecosystem. It's one of those species that helps other native species grow and creates little islands of fertility. And I was really hoping that we would be able to find some so that there was possibility for those. Um, sagebrush to regenerate after the fire or come back and maybe have more grow again. Great, thank you. No problem. All righty, we're good to go. Thanks. Okay, thank you everyone. So we were scheduled to take a five minute break at 4.45. It looks like things are running ahead of schedule. So I wanted to check with the judges, would we still like to take a break now and come back at 4.45? We'll take a five minute break. Yeah, let's, let's take a five minute break at this time. Um, which would be at uh, so 4.40 p.m. We will resume again. Okay. All right, I will see everyone back at 4.40. Thank you.
Okay. So for the next section of talks, we are going to enter the biomedical sciences topic. And I will now ask Jocelyn to please share her story. Perfect. I'd like to introduce Jocelyn Castillo, whose talk is titled, titled Investigating the Correlation Between Immune Responses and Collagen Deposition in the Lungs of Amphibole Asbestos Exposed Mice Through the Use of Multi-Photon Microscopy and Paraffin Tissue Embedding. Jocelyn, may I start the timer? Yep, we're good. Okay, I'm starting the timer now. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Castillo, and the project that I will be presenting today is something that I have been working on the past year and a half in Dr. Servi's lab. And like previously mentioned, it has to do with looking at the correlation between immune responses and collagen deposition in mice that have been exposed to amphibole asbestos through techniques such as multi-photon microscopy and paraffin tissue embedding. So to start off, it would be a good idea to um, define what asbestos fibers are. Asbestos fibers are naturally occurring fibers, usually found in rock deposits, but also known to be um, used in things, well, to have been used in things such as um, construction work, um, specifically insulation. And so some of the effects of asbestos exposure are the possible development of diseases such as cancers, autoimmune disorders, pleural fibrosis um, or excessive collagen deposition, which is what our research revolves around. And previous findings suggest that individuals that have been exposed to asbestos develop these anti-mesothelial cell autoantibodies, which are the driving force behind excessive collagen deposition. And so the hypothesis for this project is that mice with anti-mesothelial cell autoantibodies or MCAAs will display higher collagen levels in the pleural tissue. So just to um, orient ourselves, we are looking at this area right here, the pleural cavity. So in order to be able to either prove or disprove our hypothesis, we began by having a group of um, mice that had been exposed to different types of asbestos fibers. And of course, our control group that had been exposed to simply saline. And um, through using multi-photon microscopy, which is where we obtain these two images over here, we were able to scan the lung tissue. And we expected to find that these um, images on the right for example, um, that are brighter and more intense, belong to mice that had um, higher collagen level depositions. And while these um, images like this that are more dull and less bright belong to mice that had not been exposed to um, asbestos and have lower collagen levels. Um, however, once putting together all the data, we found that there was really no statistical um, significant difference between the different groups that, um, for example, the group that had been simply exposed to saline and the group that had been exposed to the different types of asbestos fibers. Um, our current steps, though, are taking that same group of lung tissue and um, embedding it in paraffin wax and sectioning it, mounting that tissue onto slides and using hematoxylin and eosin staining. Um, we are able to hopefully be um, able to look at the architecture of the tissue. And we expect to find that mice that have simply been exposed to saline will show this clear architecture, while mice that have been exposed to asbestos will show these aggregates of lymphocytes indicating some sort of localized immune response. And so, yes, that is all I have for today. I hope that you have found this research to be of some interest. And yes, thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Okay. Do the judges have any questions at this time? We do not. Perfect. Then I will pass it off to the audience. Hey, Jocelyn, I have a question for you. Oh, I got to raise my hand. There we go. 
Oh, sorry. Can I ask a question or are you going to the next one? Oh, I think you could ask the question. Oh, okay. Um, no, I'm really, this is like really good research because um, asbestos has really affected uh, marginalized communities that uh, were exposed to it in construction jobs. So um, I, I just want to congratulate you on that work. And I think that through just you uh, doing this type of research, it, you know, it could be really important to get it out to communities that don't really understand how affected they might be when they are exposed to asbestos. So I just want to tell you that this is like really great, great work. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sonia. The judges have finished their deliberations. Thank you, judges. Okay. Can I please have Jared share the screen now? Perfect. Next, I'd like to introduce Jared Nesson, whose talk is titled Generating Plasmid Constructs for In Situ Hybridization. Jared, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes. Okay, I'm starting it now. How do we know when and where certain genes are expressed? Through a method called In Situ Hybridization. The first key step to performing in situ hybridization is to isolate an RNA sequence and clone it into a plasmid vector. And that's what I did this semester. In the Ray lab, we used the African clawed frog as a model to study the molecular drivers of embryonic development. Previous research has shown that the transcription factor HIC1 affects neural crest migration, which is an essential process that leads to the development of cranial facial bones. HIC1 does this through the regulation of the canonical Wnt signaling pathway, but we don't know how exactly it regulates the signaling. Through RNA sequencing experiments, genes involved in the Wnt signaling pathway were identified that may help give us an answer to this. A few of these genes, Frizzled 8, FOXD1, and Clodin 6, were used to generate plasma constructs for in situ hybridization. The first step of this process was designing a cloning strategy. To develop the plasma construct, I needed to identify the target gene sequence, develop primers to this sequence, and identify restriction enzymes that would be used to insert the sequence into the plasmid vector PBSKS2. Using the ZenBase website, which contains, which contains Xenophis gene information, I constructed an mRNA sequence by combining exons and identified primers unique to this sequence. I compared restriction enzyme sites present in the multiple cloning site of the BSKS2 plasmid to the RNA sequence and chose two restriction enzymes that were not present in the sequence to add to the five prime ends of my primers. Now that my primers were constructed, I amplified the RNA sequence through PCR I performed a restriction enzyme digest on the RNA sequence and the BSKS2 plasmid to create complementary sticky ends. Through ligation, these sticky ends base paired, inserting the RNA sequence into the multiple cloning site of the plasmid. Now that my plasmid construct was complete, I needed to make more of it. To do this, I took advantage of the natural machinery bacteria used to replicate. I transformed the construct into E. coli cells that made more of the construct as they reproduced. Since I needed individual clones, I grew the construct on media containing the antibiotic ampicillin. PBSKS2 has an ampicillin-resistant gene, so any colonies that grow should contain the plasmid. Six of these colonies were chosen and grown in liquid culture to further propagate the plasmid, which was then isolated and another restriction enzyme digest was done. I ran these six samples using gel electrophoresis to confirm that the plasmid contained the inserted RNA sequence. Once confirmed, one of these clones was chosen and submitted for sequencing to show that the RNA sequence was in fact the sequence I wanted to clone. So in one semester, I successfully cloned three different genes into a plasmid vector that can be used in future research to answer important questions regarding HIC1 and the Wnt signaling pathway. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. 
Okay, do the judges have any questions at this time? I think we're okay, thank you. Okay. And if the audience has any questions, feel free to chime in or raise your hand. Hi, Jared, that, that was a great talk. I have a question for you. So yeah. uh, in terms of uh, the three genes that you were looking at, um, what is the importance of those three genes and how would they be hypothesized to fit into the pathway or in, during signaling? So I'm not completely sure about where they will fit in the pathway. That'll be part of future research, I believe. So what I did was develop the constructs that'll be used to visualize where the genes are expressed inside of the Xenopus embryos. Okay. I was wondering if there's any known, um, you know, comparison with other uh, developing uh, vertebrates is there any homology or similarity in how those genes could be involved? Not completely sure, but probably. Okay, thank you. Hi, Jared, I, I have a question that might not be super, super relevant, but I'm just curious when you, you grow the different, um, the bacteria on the plate and then you pick six colonies. Are there a lot more than six? And how do you pick which six to then grow up in the broth? Yeah, there are usually a few more than six. Like I usually got like 12 to 14. And I would just choose colonies that had clear borders. So they didn't have like the satellite colonies around because if they have the satellite colonies, that means that the antibiotic has been diluted. So that just, ensured that we had genetically identical colonies when I chose them. Neat, thank you. I have another question if you have a minute. <laughs> that is, uh, what, what was like something like that you found that was unexpected while you were this during this process? Um. I don't know about really unexpected, but doing the ligation itself, like putting the RNA sequence into the plasmid was kind of finicky sometimes, so it didn't always work out. So I just had to redo that a few times. Thank you. Yeah, it's always when you're actually doing work at the bench, it's way harder with way more limitations sometimes. But that's good. Judges are ready to move on if there are no more questions. Okay, thank you. Nellie, can I please have you share your screen? Perfect. Next, I'd like to introduce Nellie Kuzuza whose talk is titled Fossil Preparation and Conservation at the Idaho Museum of Natural History. Nellie, can I start the timer? Yes. All right, I'm starting it now. Hello, everyone. My name is Nellie Kuzuza, and I'm a CPI research student in the vertebrate paleobiology lab with, with Dr. Brendan Peacock as my advisor in the Idaho Museum of Natural History. My research was based on different techniques of preparing fossils with the purpose of conserving them for future usage. Before I dive into my research here in these slides, here in this picture of a dinosaur called Orichodromium, meaning, oh, okay, working. Okay. Orichodromium, meaning digging runner. Fun fact about this dinosaur is that it is an Idaho only named dinosaur, and we have its fossil here at the museum. The museum has thousands and thousands of research collection for all over Idaho, and the collection are, collect, are collected underground. Here in this picture, I'm in the collection storage room, which is an underground at the museum, and I'm doing inventories. When doing inventories, I record the site and the specimen number of the fossil, which means once the fossil is collected at a given uh, cave, at the given site, like a cave, it's brought to the museum and given a specific number. 
Then the storage room location, it means in what cabinet and what drawer number the fossil are stored. Here are the cabinets, here are the cabinets, and here are the drawers. Finally, the nature of the specimen, if it is a complete fossil or if it's a fragment of fossil. One interesting fossil I found during inventories is a huge, heavy cervical uh, vertebrae of Idaho camel called Elmer. And here in this picture, you can see how big of a difference is the human cervical vertebrae and the camel's Elmer's vertebrae. Finally, in my research, I learned how to use different tools to prepare the fossil. Here in this picture, I'm preparing a Hergeman horse vertebrae by using an air scrub and magnifying glass loop to remove any particles or stone attached on the, on the fossil. The purpose of preparing the fossil is to preserve them for future research and exhibition like Skull, everyone got one. This exposition is currently happening at the museum, which different species skulls are on display. I would like to end my presentation by inviting everyone to visit the museum and also our research lab and its careful more of Idaho on collection. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Great talk. Do the judges have any questions at this time? I think we're okay. Okay. And I can now pass any questions off to, or invite any questions from the audience. Anyone have any? I might start us off. I have a quick question um, for Nelly. You mentioned that um, you were looking at some fossils that yes. are found from Idaho. Mm -hmm. are, is it only Idaho that you're looking at right now? Or are you also looking at other excavation sites? I currently, I, I'm sure that we're looking at some of the fossils that were collected here on site in Idaho that so far that I know like bone, like bone fill locations, like also in the caves here in Idaho, that's the one I'm so far I've looked at. Oh, that's really cool. So mm -hmm. I know that it's all from Idaho. Yeah. And more about the Napoleon. Hi, Nelly. I have a question. Yes. Um, what's your favorite fossil or like the most interesting fossil you've gotten the opportunity to work on in the museum this semester? Um, like working on the working on the Hergeman horse fossil um, vertebrae was really interesting because once I was starting to work on it, like using the air scrub, whenever I was trying to clean some stones or anything on the fossil, it would start to break. So Dr. Brandon Pico really came over and saved me, helped me, showed me a way to hold the needle and a way to work on fossils, like clean it in or, uh, to the point where you cannot like destroy them or cut them in fragments, like still look good for in order to display it in a museum or use it in research. So that was one of my favorite thing to work on. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're good to go. Okay, thank you. So, Trinity, can I please have you share your screen? Can everyone see that okay? Yes, it looks good on my end. Okay, I'd like to introduce Trinity Hammond, whose talk is titled Mindfulness in Athletics. Trinity, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes. Okay, starting it now. Good evening, everyone. As she said, my name is Trinity Hammond, and my research was done under Dr. Kurt Anderson for my honors thesis. To start out, to define mindfulness, there's a picture right here. There's an owner walking their dog, and in the dog's hot bubble shows the scenery, but in the owner's thought bubble, it has home life, work life, and worrying about bills. And for mindfulness, it's being aware of what's in the present and what's right in front of you. And I have that applied into, if it'll move further. 
and that is applied into athletics. And in my project, I did a meta-analysis on mindfulness and athletics and mindfulness practices can include meditation, different forms of yoga and Tai Chi. And within that four studies were looked at and different experiences in professional leagues with mindfulness. And in those studies, it was the methods used dealt with questionnaires that asked athletes on their ratings of stress levels, anxiety, coping and emotional regulation using mindfulness in, in situations and not. And then from that research, it was the results show that there was a decrease in deep thought, difficulty in motion and regulation and in stress and anxiety. And there was also an increase in being able to cope. And in one study specified on injuries and there was an increase in pain tolerance with that. In conclusion, through my research, I suggest that mindfulness increases performance and cognitive ability in sports. However, the exact methodology to produce the most positive outcomes currently still under study and has become a source of significant scientific interest to sports psychologists and neurologists. Because of this, the study on what I looked at has been recent in the last few decades and it's ever growing in the research behind it. Thank you. Thank you, Trinity. Okay, do the judges have any questions at this time? Surprisingly, no questions. Thank you, judges. And does the audience have any questions? I, I might have a quick question, um, Kennedy. Um, so you were doing a meta-analysis. Um, uh, did you find, I guess I'm wondering what the most interesting study you found is when you were putting together the literature? The most interesting study was on pain tolerance because they had athletes stick, stick their hand in cold water and for zero to eight minutes and throughout eight weeks it tested the ratings of their pain levels and the group that did meditational work with that had higher pain tolerance than the other group so I found that interesting and I didn't think that could help with it. Yeah that is really really interesting. I know that there's been some research with using meditation to alleviate pain or I, I don't know if this is just a TV thing, but helping people get through small surgeries with meditation. Yeah, there's a doctor named Kevin Zen that he had a mindfulness practice and it focused on people who are in severe pain. And that was, it was like in 1979 when that all started. And so his research heavily relies on different pain tolerances and that. Interesting. Thanks. Um, I will pass it off to Dr. Tanan. Hey, that, that was a fun talk, Trinity. I was wondering uh, during your searches, like what, um, what were there any specific dem demographics that your search was yielding or, um, you know, um, like, or how many studies are out there that are really looking at this question? It's ever growing right now. There wasn't too many new studies to look at, but within the last 10 years, it's really kind of skyrocketed in it. And it's harder because there's not a specific reasoning on the science of how this is working. And so with more information coming in, hopefully they'll be able to conclude what's actually going on in the neuroscience of it. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Dr. Sturt. Trinity, I was just wondering, and you may have, you kind of touched on this, but if there was any specific mindfulness practice that you found was a, I would say the best one, but that maybe had a bigger advantage compared to others? 
The ones that were most used often was actual meditation. In one of the studies, they just had a mindfulness coach with them and just having them be aware of it. In a lot of cases, athletes don't understand that they're using mindfulness and because it could be done with just having your headphones in and just being calm and in the moment. So it's hard to, they weren't really specific on which forms they used in it. There are no more questions. I think we're good to move on. Okay, thank you. Megan, can I please have you share your screen? Looks good. Okay, I'd like to introduce Megan Pondy whose talk is titled Analysis of Weight Loss Supplement Ingredients Using Thin Layer Chromatography. Megan, are you ready for me to begin the timer? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm starting the timer now. All right, good evening, everybody. My name is Megan Condi, and I want to just start out by asking each of you to think about the dietary supplements that you've taken in your life. All the individual vitamins and minerals and extracts that you might consume in pursuit of health or other specific goals. Now I want you to think about how those products are regulated. Do you actually know how they're regulated? Now, the government agency that does regulate these products, the FDA, does not physically examine the ingredients or efficacy of these supplements before they're placed on the market, which puts consumers at risk of purchasing potentially adulterated or unsafe products. Now, unsurprisingly, a 2018 study found that the majority of adulterated supplements reported to the FDA were marketed for weight loss or sexual enhancement. And what I found even more surprising is that the main adulterants in these products were actually prescription drugs or ingredients that had been removed from the market years ago. And this is what I wanted to uh, focus my research on this semester. I wanted to attempt to separate the ingredients of a variety of weight loss supplements in order to find out what exactly these capsules contained. So to begin, I examined the contents of weight loss supplements using thin layer chromatography, which is, I'm sure many of you know, is a separation technique that separates mixtures based on different polarities. Now, originally, I planned to use TLC as a stepping stone to calm chromatography. However, as research tends to go, I found the results I found results I was not expecting. The TLC plates I had expected to resolve in a few weeks consumed my entire semester of research. Because no matter how much I experimented with solvent ratios and dilutions and other minute details, my samples would not separate into individual spots, as can be seen in this first figure. And after diluting my samples to ensure that the issue was not overloading my plants, as can be seen in the second figure, I came to the conclusion that the issue was actually plant extracts. Now, the manufacturers of these supplements had used a variety of plant extracts in their supplements, and they had not bothered to isolate the specific active ingredients that they were searching for, which left an unidentified number of unknown plant compounds in these supplements. And while this wasn't the conclusion I was expecting, it still has some important implications. One of which is that people who are consuming these products do not know exactly what compounds they're putting into their bodies and in unknown quantities. And this is the main issue. We simply do not know what these compounds are. And comparing these, to these dietary supplement TLC plates with those of a headache relief tablet seen here in the third figure. This tablet contained acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. And while I didn't have time to perfect spots as much as I wanted to, you can see here how it, uh, it separates into three individual spots that correspond to their respective drug on the right. And this is the difference in what you're purchasing, a tablet in which you know the exact compounds within it, or a capsule containing an unidentified number of unknown compounds. So I hope that these visuals impress upon you the importance of changing current supplement regulations. And I hope that this small research project will support the efforts of other researchers to take a more critical look at what we're putting into our bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to check in with the judges and see if they have any questions. I think we're okay. Okay. And if the audience has any questions, then feel free to ask them now. It looks like we have a question from Barbara Frank. 
I was just wondering, Megan, what um, got you interested in doing this project? I was so going to ask the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm actually say, what got you interested? Yeah, so I'm actually a pharmacy tech, Oops, sorry, it's my desk, but I'm actually a pharmacy technician at RMAC. And so I was actually doing continuing education for my license. And I read an article that was about how dietary supplements are regulated. And I was actually really surprised that supplements, they're not, they don't actually um, physically examine the ingredients or make sure, making sure that they're efficacious before they're put onto the market, like they do with prescription drugs. And so then obviously that can put them up to more it could be adulterated um, ingredients in there and things like that. And that's why a lot of those uh, dietary supplements actually have been found to have um, some ingredients in there that they shouldn't have. And I thought it was really interesting that some of them actually had prescription drugs, like some of the ones for sexual enhancement actually have prescription drugs that you see in like Viagra and things like that. And so we don't want people taking prescription drugs along with, you know, maybe they're already taking other prescription drugs and they don't know that maybe that these two, um, drugs could interact in a negative way. So that's kind of what got me interested and I thought it was uh, kind of a fun project to do. So thank you, Dr. Frank. Good job. So just to uh, make sure I understand. So when you dietary supplements, they could just leave the ingredients as like yarrow extract or something like that, but they don't have to individually list the active ingredients necessarily like, or all of them. Just yeah. So basically like, like I was saying with that um, combination drug that had like aspirin and acetaminophen and caffeine in it, you know exactly what those compounds look like and what exactly you're putting into your body. Whereas with these other, like I looked into weight loss supplements specifically, but they have like some of them contain like five different kinds of plant extracts. And even the one I looked into that only contained one, they all don't actually try, the companies don't actually try to go in there and isolate those active ingredients. Sometimes they'll try to standardize it to have like a certain percentage and sometimes they won't. So you mean they could be wanting to put caffeine in there from like a coffee bean extract, but they may not, you may not even know how much you're taking. And then not only are you not just taking caffeine, you're taking whatever else was inside of that plant at the time. So that's kind of the issue that's going on with those. Oh, interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's interesting that they fit into like a loophole of what they have to disclose. And I've heard something similar about makeup or anything that you put topically. Um, also, they, they have issues with properly labeling all the active ingredients, which, uh, I think it's super interesting. Yeah. So, and, and there's a, in dietary supplements, it's like a billion dollar industry. And I think most people probably just take, you know, your vitamin Bs and things like that, which I think are a lot, have a lot much more like safe. But for the people who are taking some of these like sketchier <laughs> supplements, like weight loss or sexual enhancement, or another big group was for like muscle enhancement, like they would have steroids in them sometimes and things like that. So uh, for those ones, there's still quite a few people who take those. Like I went and got my hair cut and my, um, my hairdresser was like, oh, actually, I'm taking a weight loss supplement right now. I didn't even research it, but I just started taking it. She gave it to me so I could try to do a, a TLC plate with it and look into it for her. But yeah. Oh, wow. If there are no more questions, we're all good in the judge's room. I got them. Okay. Next, I will have Nicole share their screen. Perfect. I'd like to introduce Nicole Bliss, whose talk is titled Analysis of the Effectiveness of Hippotherapy Using the Vicon Nexus System. Nicole, uh, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yeah. Okay. I'll start it right now. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole Bliss. And for the past semester, I have been working with Dr. Marion in her for her research. And so we are studying, trying to quantify the effects, not the effects, the benefits of hippotherapy. And so, oops. 
sorry guy there we go so hippotherapy is a form of therapy that utilizes the natural gait and movement of a horse to provide motor and sensory input to the rider and so this so hippotherapy has been used to help patients with physical and mental disorders and it has many benefits including trunk and core stability improved postural symmetry and enhanced balance and strength just to name a few and while this is an effective form of therapy, it is not widely accepted because there isn't quantitative data to support the improvements that these patients are making. And so that is the goal of this project. And so this project was started a few years back by Dr. Marion using these inertial sensors, which if you can see my mouse, it's what I'm circling right here. And so she's completed that project, but now we are trying the current project that I am working on is using the Vicon Nexus motion capture cameras to confirm and further support her findings. And so this image right here shows the camera setup that we are using in the biomechanics lab. And down here is the current setup that we have determined to most effectively find to quantify this data. And so as you can see here, we decided to use clusters of markers rather than individual markers. So we more closely relate to these inertial sensors. And then these pictures over here is the actual setup. We are using the stability ball to replicate the movement of a horse while the subject sitting on the ball moves this tinker toy tower from place to place. And the Vicon Nexus system picks up and records the movement of both the ball and the rider, basically. And so the overarching goal of this project is to analyze and um, collect quantitative data on hippotherapy. And so we will be analyzing the data that we collect using the Vicon system in LabVIEW. And so these are just, this is a sample of the code that we are using and so the goal of this project, we would love to have quantitative data to support the benefits and improvements that this hippotherapy can make. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, perfect timing. Okay, do the judges have any questions at this time? I, uh, uh, we actually do have one question. Uh, why is it called uh, hippotherapy if it stimulates horse movement? So hippotherapy, the hippo portion actually means horse in Greek. And so it's horse therapy. Gotcha, thank you. I think other than that, we're good. Okay, thank you. And does anyone in the audience have any questions? I have a question. Um, good talk, Nicole. I'm curious with the stability ball, how you simulate the movement of the horse. Is there like the platform that the ball is sitting on? Does it move the ball or are you moving it yourself with your body in the kind of motion of so that was actually one of the greatest challenges that we've faced with this project, just because we have yet to find something that perfectly simulates the movement of a horse. And so what we decided was we're going to use the stability ball just to get all forms of motion rather than limiting the motion to whatever device we come up with. And so the ball just provides, it mimics the rider's motion. And so that's more of why we're using the stability ball and not anything else. Great, thank you. I have a question, Nicole. Yeah. Um, actually, there's a hippo camp down the street from my house. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know anything about them until, of course, I drive by it now every day. But, um, and, and a lot of parents arrive with their children. 
do, do you know in your research, do they start them out first using the, you know, that therapy with the ball or before they put them on the horse? I mean, cause it, I know horses and they're pretty rough or they can be. Mm -hmm. So actually the ball is specific to our project. Uh -huh. Actual hippotherapy, if you send your child or patient to get hippotherapy, they will start you out on a horse. But the horses are very mellow and you have at least three people. You have two people spotting the rider as well as someone walking the horse. And so the horse does not go any faster than a slow walk. So it's fairly safe. Hmm. Thank you. I have a quick question if we have time. Great. Um, so did you say that in your research on the ball, the person on the ball is also moving a tower around? Could you explain a little bit more about that? So hippotherapy, you are actually doing therapy while riding the horse. And so by doing that, you're st stimulating a bunch of mother muscles that you wouldn't normally in just basic therapy because basic therapy, you're just working that area. And so what we're doing with the Tinker Toy Tower is we're just simulating a, an a exercise that they may do while riding a horse and then monitoring how the rider's balance or posture changes while they move it. Interesting, thanks. The judges are done deliberating and I believe it's break time, I'm not mistaken. Yes, we have a five minute break scheduled and um, we're a little bit behind, but would you guys still like to, us to reconvene in five minutes? 5.25. Yeah, so we'll just do a three minute break and then reconvene at 5.25, that's okay. Okay, perfect. I'll see everyone back at 5.25.
Okay. So we're going to continue on the topic of biomedical sciences. Can I please have Tanner share his screen? Did that show up all right? Yes. Okay, I'd like to introduce Tanner Hill, whose talk is titled Canine Blastomycosis Diagnostic Implications Using ELISA Considering North South Regionality. Tanner, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes, go for it. All right, starting it now. All right, hey everyone. As Karina just mentioned, my name is Tanner Hill. I've been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Shirley over the past few semesters for independent problems. And I just wanted to share a little bit of data that we gathered last fall semester. And this one kind of has a little bit of a biomedical and a, and a microbiology implications. Uh, so to begin, I, to, I first wanted to discuss kind of the premise of this research. So we we're focusing on blastomycosis, which is a fungal infection caused by the dimorphic fungus blastomyces dermatitidis. Uh, specifically, we wanted to look at blastomycosis in dogs as their behaviors make them especially, especially prone to infection. And there is systemic concerns of um, systemic infection following initial infection. Uh, so there are, it is important for research to assess diagnostic capabilities of this organism. And I also kind of wanted to uh, focus on the geographic distribution of this organism. So I included a map over here on the right side of the slide showing that Blastomyces dermatitis is found all the way from Canada down into the Southern United States. And what we really hope to assess was whether there are any region-based variation in the humoral immune responses from the northern, from serum samples obtained from the northern United States versus the southern United States. So whether these antigen antibody uh, reactions are greater in one area than the other. So in order to do so, we uh, decided to use an indirect ELISA, and this is to detect antibody presence in these canine serum samples. And we had two Kind of sources of canine serum samples. We had it from the northern United States, I believe in Wisconsin, and then the southern United States, which I believe was Tennessee, if I'm remembering correctly. And then we assessed these eight antigen lysates, and I've listed them on the slide here, and we'll see them a little bit more on the next slide. And in order to kind of quantify any type of differences between the north and south samples, we used two sample t-tests, so pretty basic statistical analysis here. And I showed just a little bit of a, uh, a little image showing this process on the bottom of the screen. So here's some data we found. And what you can see, or I showed the eight antigen lysates on the x-axis here. And then this was graphed against the mean absorbance values. So a higher absorbance value would indicate the a greater antigen antibody reaction or more of this reaction occurring in a single well. And what we found was that this 248 antigen lysate, so just one, one of these that was labeled, exhibited the highest reactivity against both the southern samples which are indicated by the gray bars here, and the northern samples, which are indicated by the black bars. I also wanted to look quickly at the ERC2 on the right side. This one showed was really effective in diagnosing this, the southern samples, but not so sort of effective for the northern samples. So from this, we kind of postulated that T27 and 85, which are among those four, first four there, may be more efficacious in uh, being a more robust tool for diagnosis when used in uh, perhaps different areas. And I guess one more thing, um, partially due with COVID and toward the end of the semester, we didn't replicate the last four antigens here as many times as the other ones. So that's perhaps why st statistical significant values weren't obtained for those ones. And that is all I have. Thank you, Tanner. Okay. Do judges have any questions at this time? Well, no, no. We're supposed to know. no, we we don't have any. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, judges. And if the audience has any questions, we can take those now. I have a question, Tanner. What was the most interesting thing you learned in this project? Uh, the, I'd say the most interesting thing was, oh, so my evolutionary knowledge is a little bit limited, but when we were kind of establishing the premise for this research, there was a cryptic species that was identified that's kind of more localized to the Northern United States. It's called uh, Blastomyces gilchristii, I believe. 
And um, it was postulated that about 1.9 million years ago this was when these two species evolved. So kind of from this, I was expecting that we would observe greater reactivities for most of these antigen lysates against kind of the northern samples rather than the southern samples. And for both, this data was only from, or these data was only from last semester. Um, and we found that the southern samples uh, exhibited the highest reactivities here. But, and this was the same with a, we did this a prior semester as well. So I would say that was kind of the most interesting is that I would expect the northern samples to exhibit the higher reactivities just in case there's any type of kind of antigenic simul similarities, but, or I would assume there would be antigenic similarities between the two species since they are morphologically uh, identical. But yeah, that's what I would say. Thanks for the question, Dr. Brink. Question for you, Tanner. Um, yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about the antigen lysates and um, where where they came from? How did you know? How did you obtain those samples? And yeah, I can do my best to explain that, and it's not going to be a very good explanation. But <laughs> this is research that's been done in Dr. Scalaroni's lab for quite some time at ISU, and I know that they were in his laboratory, but when I kind of came onto this project, I wasn't involved in any type of um, coordinating any type of receiving these samples or really knowing where they're from. I know uh, I have some data not with me, obviously, where these the serum samples were obtained, but not not really the antigen lysates. So I apologize that my answer isn't super great for that, but. Yeah, um, the judges um, are done deliberating. I guess we're done. Perfect. Thank you, Tanner. Okay. Now I will have Adrian. Can you please share your screen? It looks good on my end. Next, I'd like to introduce Adrian Quebec, whose talk is titled Sphingomyelin Synthase Inhibition, Inhibition in Sarcomas results in ceramide accumulation and apoptosis. Adrian, may I start the timer? Yes. Okay, I'm starting it now. Thank you. So my name is Adrian Pavic, and a simple summary of what my research project is, is that I'm trying out a new drug as a potential cancer treatment. And the type of cancer we work with is a muscle cancer. It's called synovial sarcoma. So one thing about cancers in general is they're really good at growing and dividing. And in order to do so, they need high quality membranes in their cells, their cell membranes. And so an important component to that is a molecule called sphingomyelin. So this drug called Jaspin B has been shown in previous studies to inhibit sphingomyelin. And it's also been shown to um, stop cancer growth in other types of cancers but it hasn't been studied in synovial sarcoma yet. So the goal of this research was to see if Jaspin B is able to induce cell death in this muscle cancer. And one fun fact about Jaspin B is that it's actually a natural marine product that is created by sponges off the coast of Australia. And so in order to test Jaspin B, we first applied it to cells in our laboratory. We have cell cultures, um, that we grow in dishes in our lab. And as you can see in this image, as we increased the doses of Jaspin B, we saw increased cell death in our cancer cells, which is fantastic. That's what we were hoping for. And then as you can see over here in this image, the blue cells are cancer cells that are alive and the green cells are cancer cells that have died. So when we gave our cancer cells Jaspin B, we observed an increased amount of cell death in those cells. Our next step was giving Jaspin B to mice that had synovial sarcoma tumors. And so we were giving the mice Jaspin B three times a week and um, we were measuring their tumors at the same time. So this orange graph was the mice that received Jaspin B treatment. And as you can see, their tumors did not increase in size over the trial, but the blue the control mice that did not receive Jaspin B did see an increase 
in tumor growth. Now this red arrow points to a part in our study where we um, started giving the control mice Jaspin B. And after we started giving them Jaspin B, we saw a sharp decline in tumor growth, and then they continued to grow on. And we think that continued growth was due to the tumors having different um, metabolic needs, different mutations. And so at first, the Jaspin B was able to kill off the, um, the cancer cells that were reliant on the sphingomyelin that we talked about earlier. But then after that, they were able to adapt quickly in large tumors. But again, the smaller tumors had really good results. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Okay. Do the judges have any questions? Nothing. Okay. Do the audience have any questions at this time? Looks like Barbara Frank. Hi, Adrian. Nice job. I'm just wondering if there's any evidence that that uh, treatment affects normal cells. Right. So we were concerned about this as well. So we examined whether it would have an effect on mitochondria because mitochondria also have cell membranes. And we saw that it affected um, their integrity a little bit. So they were a little more leaky, but overall it didn't change the number of them. And when we gave Jasper B to our mice, we did not observe any negative side effects or toxicity in the animal model. And did you, were you assessing their behavior too? I'm wondering about behavior. Right, we did not assess behavior. Really interesting, thank you. Okay, we could take the question from Dr. Francisco. Hey Adrian, great talk, very interesting research. I was just curious, so now that this seems promising, what is your next step? Right, so, um, the sphingomyelin lipid that Jaspin B inhibits is part of a ceramide pathway. And so we were thinking cancer cells are really good at adapting and surviving. So if we cut off one lipid, it might try to push that pathway in another direction in order to survive. So we were trying to do a combination therapy of Jaspin B with some other inhibitors involved in that pathway. And we actually didn't observe any synergy between that multi-drug but we did observe um, an increased response if we combined Jaspin B with doxorubicin, so common chemotherapy. Yeah. Um, we're done deliberating. Okay, thank you, judges. So the next section of talks falls under the topic of ecology and conservation biology. And can I please have Tesh share your screen? Okay. I'd like to introduce Tesh Pandi whose talk is titled Sources and Controls of Intermittent Headwater Streams in Gibson Jack, or Intermittent Headwater Streams in Gibson Jack. Sorry about that. Um, are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes. Okay, I'm starting it now. Hi, everyone. My name is Tejdan Pandey, and I am working with Dr. Lossi's lab, understanding the controls and sources of diesel organic carbon in intermittent streams in Gibson Jack Creek. DOC is a dissolved form of soil, soil organic carbons, which is important for the aquatic animals for survival, as well as important for understanding global carbon cycling. Previous study has shown that the dissolved organic carbon fluxes varies along the water state linked to the streams. But the controls and availability of water extractable organic carbon is poorly studied. To understand the controls and availability of DOC fluxes linked to the streams, I'm interested I was interested in this research. And my research question was, how does water extractive organ carbon where there are changes among vegetation types and what might be the controls affecting WEOC? So I propose a several hypothesis. First, I propose that SOC and pH will positively correlate with the DOC 
as well as its interaction. Similarly, I propose that the Yasushi will decreases as depth increases along the soil, and also as whereas pH will pH will pH will increases as depth increases. So I analyzed all the soils in Dr. Losi's lab. I calculate the WEOC. I calculate the pH and the SOC. And my, my concern was how does the water extract organic carbon vary among water among vegetation types? And I found that it has great variation with depth and vegetation types. I observed great various, I observed a large amount of WEOC in riparian, riparian habitat, whereas I found one one great one observation I observed one large variation in on coniferous depth 10 to 15 centimeter as I assume that there is more accumulation of DOC while leaching through the soil. From that from the lift graph I I conclude that the WC was highest on surface level and which decreases as depth depth increases. And also looking at the controls on pH and SOC, I observed pH showed little variation among the vegetation type as pH has highest sagebrush habitat has higher pH than the rest of the habitat. And I conclude that WC is highest with a low pH. While looking at the SOC, I found positive correlation with, with WEOC. I found 94% variation in WEOC in riparian habitat, whereas 94% 94% variation in WEC is shown by SOC on the sagebrush habitat, which, which gives an idea that the riparian habitat has more DOC accumulation than the other habitat. After looking at the interaction with SOC and PS, PS shows little variation with WOC than SOC. So I conclude that SOC is the major controller of WOC. As I found 87% highly significant DOC fluxes among, among, the, among, the, among this vegetation watershed. So my finding, I found that a lot of my habitats was supported. Uh, so my, my main conclusion was WC is highly controlled by the SOC, you know, stream ecosystem and understanding this helped to understand the global carbon cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do the judges have any questions at the time? No, we do not. Thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Dr. Colin Baxter. Hi, Tej. That's, in, that's interesting. Those are some interesting results. I wonder if, um, so the Gibson Jack Creek drainage is really kind of interesting. It's got uh, one side of the drainage dominated by conifer trees and vegetation and the other side not. Um, do you think that some of your findings and results might explain the patterns in uh, dissolved organic carbon in the streams, um, um, you know, one on one side of the drainage network versus the other, for example? That was a good question. Uh, basically, I did all my observations on the lab, so on, on the on the lab, so I haven't studied about that. I will. I would like to study on like next one year about the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of all the watershed. So that will be good research. Yeah, it's interesting that the the riparian vegetation seems to contribute a lot to the to the streams, dissolved organic carbon, but that the upland trees um, can as well, it seems like based on your results, if I interpret correctly. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have deliberated, thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Taj. Can I please have Lauren share their screen? Okay, I'd like to introduce Lauren Stidham, whose talk is titled 
population dynamics and distribution of the stonefly Europerla brevis in a wilderness stream network. Lauren, are you ready for me to start the timer? I am. All right, I'm starting it right now. Thank you, Karina. Good afternoon, everyone. My research is based in a headwater stream network. Um, on the wrong side. <laughs> um, my research is based on a, a headwater stream network in the Frank Church wilderness where changing climate may be directly or indirectly influencing populations of the stonefly Europe brevis. I'm interested in studying these aquatic insects because little is known about them and they appear to exist in very specific stream settings. This photo shows a stream that is very typical for Y brevis habitat. It is small, mossy, and also stays very, fairly stable uh, temperature throughout the year. That is important for their semi-volatile life cycle because each insect may live in the stream for several years before emerging. Any alterations in these conditions may have major effects on their survival. Consistent long-term monitoring of two headwater streams in the late summer for the past 24 years begun by the late Doc Minchell, indicates that Y. brevis has gone from being scarce or undetectable to peaking in abundance during the mid 2000s, then dropping back to nearly indetectable numbers shortly thereafter. Here you can see flow data from a nearby stream um, showing monthly maximum flow, which is likely indicative of historical conditions that um, could have caused habitat alterations um, that, uh, caused um, changes in uh, Bahineer and Goat Creek. Um, because of the semi-volatile life cycle of white brevis, we speculate that the heightened numbers in the mid-2000s were made possible by several consecutive years of lighter flow, especially during these winter months. Um, prompted by these observations, we chose to further investigate stream supporting white brevis populations. In tandem with the microinvertebrate community study led by master student Sawyer Finley, we conducted a synoptic survey of 20 tributaries and 12 mainstream sites um, to assess the distribution, abundance, and habitat conditions of Y. brevis. Y. brevis were only found in nine of these sites. This map shows the distribution and number of individuals collected from the streams throughout the drainage. Along with being perennial and apparently spring fed, um, the streams containing Y. brevis were all first or second order, um, were typically below 10 degrees Celsius and had a, an abundance of mossy habitat, um, as seen in this photo over here. All nine of the streams containing Y. brevis were very similar in these traits. The other streams that were sampled were more similar to the bottom picture, which does not have any mossy habitat and is expected to freeze over during the winter months. Differing abundances of Y. brevis within the nine streams appear to be correlated with the abundance of moss. However, data from this portion of the project is still under examination. Uh, because of the importance of the mossy habitat, we speculate that long-term changes in Y. brevis populations in Goat and Pioneer Creek may be caused by climate-driven flow alterations, including drying, bed load movement, and resulting damage to mossy habitat. This idea is still being explored, and I look forward to revisiting these sites and delving deeper into long-term data in order to construct a clear idea of what might be causing these population shifts. Thank you. Let's take any questions. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we have one question. Not this time, though. No. Looks like. Dr. Padma has a question. Yeah, this was a really fun talk, Lauren. Uh, my question for you is, um, you know, uh, in terms of um, in the in the ecology literature, there's a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of evidence of predator prey relationships and how prey density and um, predator densities also fluctuate similarly, or there might be a certain delay. Do we know um, in this system what are natural predators and if uh, there it follows any kind of relationship? Um, I have not personally been able to find any literature that um, states what predators they have. Um, so I couldn't tell you. 
Okay, thank you. We are finished delivering, thank you. Thank you. Can I please have Brenna um, share the screen? Can everyone see that? Yes. Awesome. I'd like to now introduce Brenna Hale, whose talk is titled Legacy Effects of Nitrogen Pollution on Post Fire Seed Banks. Brenna, are you ready for me to begin the timer? I am. Starting now. Being an agricultural state, nitrogen enriched fertilizers are common practice in Idaho. Another shockingly common occurrence in Idaho is wildfires. But how do the effects of these last in the soil? Idaho State University's Barton Road Ecological Research Area has been the site of many soil manipulation experiments. One of these experiments, which occurred from 1997 to 2010, involved applying varying levels of nitrogen to the soil. Legacies of this experiment persist at Barton Road. The aim of our research is to understand how the legacies of previous experiments affect the total seed abundance in the soil. We hypothesized that in plots with high nitrogen manipulation, there would be a higher abundance of seeds, particularly those of invasive species. Our research began in the fall of 2020, soon after a fire ravaged through the Barton Road field, thus creating a blank slate for soil sampling. Soil cores were taken from Barton Road on October 7th. These cores were taken from 10 plots, four of which were control plots, three were low nitrogen addition plots, and three were high nitrogen addition plots. These soil cores were kept in papered bags until we homogenized and spread them across plastic pots. Each of the soil cores were separated into three replicates and were left on a greenhouse bench at ISU's Plant Sciences Greenhouse to germinate any seeds in the soil. Every day, these pots were watered with one centimeter of water. Once the seedlings were big enough to assign species, they were plucked and put into separate pots. However, we ran into some issues fully identifying some of the species. One such species was lovingly titled F4, or Forb 4. This unknown Forb would soon take over the pots, allowing it to greatly impact our data. Almost 85% of species grown were identified as F4. As for invasive species, about 9% of the total identified species were considered to be invasive in Idaho. This relatively small percentage led us to reject our hypothesis of there being a higher invasive species seed abundance in the high nitrogen addition plots. We also found that there was a very small difference in seed abundance between the control plots and the high nitrogen addition plots as seen in figure one. In this study, we also assessed the total seedling abundance in plots where there were shrubs and in plots without shrubs. The effect of plots with or without shrubs can be seen in figure two. We found that plots without shrubs had a significantly higher seed abundance than those with shrubs. However, this study is yet to be completed. The true identity of F4 is still unknown, but it is still growing in the greenhouse to see if we can determine its species. The identity of F4 is important because of its high abundance. If F4 is an invasive plant, our hypothesis may no longer be rejected. Hopefully soon this elusive plant can be identified and will be closer to knowing if nitrogen addition influences invasive seed abundance. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Perfect. Thank you, Brenna. Okay, I will quickly check in with the judges. Do the judges have any questions? We do not. Thank you. And does the audience have any questions? Hi, this is Keith Reinhardt. I have a question. Okay. My question is, is you, your hypothesis was linked to um, higher abundances in burned plots with, or, or was, let me start over. You had, <laughs> you had abundances, hypothesis related to greater abundance and nitrogen in plots. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering what the connections were between why you think you might have more plants or, or more seeds in pots with nitrogen. That's part one. And part two is if, you, and if you think that uh, if your hypothesis is linked to sort of pre-fire uh, events, or is it more of a post-fire phenomenon? Thank you. Yeah, so great question. We didn't have any plots that weren't, not, that weren't burnt. Does that make sense? So all the plots that we tested were 
post fire plots. So this solely related on post fire. And then we thought that because the plots had higher levels of nitrogen, that perhaps there would be more invasive plants growing in those plots before the fire. So perhaps they were in these high nitrogen um, areas, you know, reproducing more and perhaps having higher seed abundance when they release their seed. And that's why we are hypothesizing that there would be more in high than in the control. Great, so you were thinking that nitrogen what was leading to more abundance of greater numbers of plants in this these plots. I guess alternatively, you could think maybe uh, the nitrogen was resulting in plants, more plants or the same amount of plants just being more productive in terms of seed production too. Yeah, we'll have to look further into that because I'm not sure exactly which one we were like focused on, but I will look into that. Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Thanks for a great talk. And it looks like we have a question from Dr. Anna Brenna. Yes, I just have a, a quick question. Nice talk, Brenna. Um, how did you all decide to, to water one centimeter every single day in the greenhouse? Yeah, very good question. So we had a beaker that had like a measurement of 750 milliliters, which we said approximated was about one centimeter on top of the soil. So we would take the watering hose and go in between the beaker and however many times you went between the beakers, like let's say it was four sweeps and it went up to that 750 milliliter line, that would be your one centimeter. And then you would do that across every single pot. Ah, interesting. And were, were those water levels mimicking what might happen naturally or? Yeah, they were. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. And we are finished delivering. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brenna. Can I please have action? Share the screen. Yes. All right. Give me just one second. Right here. Can you guys see that? Yes, looks Sorry. good. Okay, for our last talk, I would like to introduce Ashton Talley, whose talk is titled Shrub Removal Legacy Effects Shape Post Fire Seed Banks. Are you ready for me to start the timer? Yes, ma'am. Okay, starting now. From 1997 to 2010, a shrub removal study was conducted at Idaho State University's Barton Road Ecological Research Area to stimulate a common clearing practice thought to improve cattle forage and sagebrush rangelands. These legacies of sage or of shrub, of shrub removal persisted through the summer when a wildfire burned all of the experimental plots. It's unclear how legacies of past landscape changes shape the responses of ecological communities to recent disturbances. We have built a long-term study to evaluate whether legacies of land clearing can affect post-wildfire plant assemblages through lasting effects on the seed bank. We predict that invasive species will be more abundant than native species in shrub removal seed banks. We collected our soil samples on October 7th in 2020 from both burn shrubs and intra-shrub regions. Um, and then we began our, ex our germination experiment on February 19th in 2021. For each sample, we homogenized the soil and divided the, it into three replicate, replicate 80 milliliter 80 milliliter subsamples and placed it on top of potting soil in pots to create a one centimeter deep caps of topsoil. The pots were then placed onto trays on a single bench in the plant sciences greenhouse and randomly rotated weekly and watered daily with one centimeter of water. Data collection took place randomly, or er, data collection took place three weeks and five weeks after the start of the germination where the germinants were counted and removed once they were large enough to reliably assign to species or morpho species. And we hypothesized that invasive plants would be more abundant than native plants in shrub removal seed banks. We identified, we were able to identify seven germinants to genus or species and counted an additional three unknown forbs and two unknown grasses as morpho species. 
Total abundance of seedlings were greater in shrub removal plots, as you can see in figure 1A. Um, the most four abundant seedlings were Bromus tectorum, Cisimbrium altissimum, Originon, and an unidentified forb, as you heard Brenna talk about. All four of these species were more abundant in the seed banks from the shrub removal plots, as you can see from figure 1B through 1E. In addition to Bromus tectorum and Cisimbrium altissimum, the known exotic invasive species also included Lactuca seriola and a species of Descurania. Overall, there were greater abundances of invasive seedlings in the shrub removal plots compared to the control plots, as you can see in figure one, or 1A, yes. <laughs> Data collection is still ongoing, however. While we are continuing to identify the species of plants in the seed banks evaluated here, the results suggest that invasive plants strongly respond, responded to shrub removal. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you. Okay. Any final questions from you judges? There are none. Thank you. Thank you. And any questions from the audience? Looks like we have one from Jeremy Brooks. Hey, Ashton, I've got a question for you. Um, very, very good talk, very interesting. Um, glad that you've got a good group of folks studying that 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 recent burn area and, and before. Definitely. Was, yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a very, very cool opportunity. Uh, I was yes. wondering if you are taking any measurements of biomass in addition to abundance, because I might, um, I, I guess the getting to the point of are, are the invasive species maybe um, having more seeds in those areas, but um, whereas the native species might have larger seeds um, with more biomass that might might be more likely to take over at post fire. And so I'm wondering if you're able to sort, sort of tease that apart abundance versus the actual biomass of those seeds. Right. As far as I'm aware, we haven't done any biomass me measurements. Um, with our cheatgrass, we started measuring the length. Um, but we, our next step is we're going out into the field and they are laying out seeds next. So um, there is a lot of work that's going into this project. And yeah, I'm not sure about the biomass. It was kind of a crazy project. Just we're, we're it's like I said, it's still ongoing this Friday. We're gonna go in and um, we still have a couple samples we're going to pull out and try and identify, and then we're going to homogenize the soil and see if anything grows. Um, so it's definitely ongoing, but yeah. Cool. Thank you. Look, looking forward to seeing uh, seeing more results in the future. Well done. Thank you. Me too. <laughs> Hi, Ashton. I have a, a quick question. I guess it goes to both you and Brenna's talk. Um, I'm really curious about that unknown forb. The unknown forb. We are, yeah. all are. Me, how, how, Miriam, and Brenna, and everyone. How are you, how do you guys, how are you going to go about trying to figure out what it is? So I think we're going to, I think the best step is we have put them into a bigger pot and we just need to grow them up and um, wait and see until they have more identifying features, flowering structures, fruiting structures. They're just too small. Right now they're just dicotyledons. And the problem with them is, is their, their leafing structures are so different. Like they have so many variable like leafing structures. So it's like, I don't know what you are. You could be anything right now. So we're just going to try and grow them up and see what it could be, but that's our next step with you four. <laughs> Great, can't wait to find out. Looks like the judges are still at work.
Okay, so that was all of the talks that we had scheduled for today. The original plan was to go into breakout rooms from here and into a bit of a Q&A sort of session, um, social session. And um, so I'm gonna just check in with the judges and see if they still like to do that. Maybe because it looks like we're a little bit over time. Five minutes. We need to know yeah. we were we've been talking for a bit. Okay, five minutes. And um, is any is someone in charge of yes? So I have created breakout rooms. So I'll be opening them up. I think we should take 10 minutes and talk to uh, everybody. But first of all, um, great talks. You all of you did a fabulous job and um, each, each uh, speaker, please go into the session that you were assigned to, and then the audience can move wherever they want to. If your Zoom is not out updated, then you may stay in the main break, uh, main room. I'll be opening the top of the rooms right now. Devlina? Yes. Is there a way for me to figure out which breakout room is which other than just Yeah, do you one? have the do you have the schedule in front of you by any chance? I don't. I figured okay. as soon as I, I started asking. Uh, okay. Let me try to pull it up. So the first uh, like we had um well the last last few talks were in session 3, so that was um uh, okay, then, then never mind. I, I can rem remember the sessions. I didn't know that I didn't. It makes perfect sense now, but it didn't okay. make sense to me that you the sessions see. were like between the breaks. And you can't see by speaker which uh, who is in which room right now. So it's just meant for everybody to mingle, but you're welcome to stay in this main room and we can mingle here too. <laughs> no way. I'm, I'm sick of mingling with you. I'm going to mingle with uh, some students. Yes, please do. <laughs> For those of you in this room, I'm wondering if you don't know how to get to the breakout room, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the toggle for the breakout rooms. I don't have anything. Oh, that's because you don't have it. It's not updated. Maybe it's not updated, but that's okay. We can just uh, talk here. I think mine was the same too. I thought I had updated it, but I guess not. I have the same issue, but I couldn't even find the update settings in mine either. Oh, I think it's, yeah, I don't know. My computer just automatically wants me to update things sometimes. So we found this, uh, you know, uh, at the last, um, at, at the last event, that's what happened a lot of the, uh, a lot of the men faculty mentors didn't have it updated and so they weren't able to join rooms but there's a uh, the fair number of uh uh you know students in this room so uh would you guys like to participate more well i mean i have questions for uh some of you but it's hard to my Zoom's not updated, I found out, so. It's totally fine, let's just talk. We can, we can mingle if you'd like. Yeah, let's just talk. And you guys, I mean, you know, like all the students have been presenting. I'm sure everybody has experiences to share and we hardly get to see each other in hallways anymore, so. I know, I never see your mouths. <laughs> just like eyes up. Yeah. Like from here. <laughs> I 
Um, I had a question. I so I don't know too much about the structure of being an undergrad at ISU, but um, does every undergrad have to connect to an advisor? No. Is it just to complete a thesis? I mean, so every undergrad gets an advisor who's assigned for courses stuff. So um, yeah, I didn't have to do a thesis though. I just wanted to do research. I specifically, I specifically did a thesis because we have the honors program here. And if you want to get an honors degree, you have to defend the thesis. That's what a lot of, yeah, all the, all the honors students have to defend theses is, and that's what. Is that true? Is that, is that required? For if you do a degree, for if you do a distinction. Yeah. Honors, yeah. Oh, that's super interesting. Well, that's really cool that like so many undergrads are involved in research. It, it was me, I don't know, I, I came from a very different school. I went to UC I was just gonna Stanford. ask where you went to school yeah. at. Uh, to one of the public colleges in California, so UC Santa Cruz, which is a pretty big school. I don't know exactly how many people are there, maybe like 15,000, but there is like a lot more demand for uh, positions in research labs than there was availability. And um, so, yeah, most of the, my fellow undergrads didn't get to do research like this. And I, I just think it's really cool that you could do that at ISU. Yeah. I tried to get into some labs and it didn't work out. Yeah, it's a little bit competitive here if you want to start young, but yeah, other than that, it's not bad. I, I liked it a lot. If you've got your, your good hookups. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the nice thing is that it seems like the class sizes are pretty reasonable here. So you get more of an opportunity to get to know the instructors. That was the other thing about my school that I wasn't a big fan of is most of my classes were like 200 people at a time. And I mostly just got to know my PAs, which were really helpful too. Well, the Not instructors me. here I've noticed are really, really great about um, noticing students in their classes and yeah. being like, hey, you did great. Would you like to work on this or help me out in my lab doing this or offering CPI positions and things, which is really awesome. Yeah, Yeah, I didn't want to keep people here too long. Um, we can always stay here uh, and open the rooms again if people want to ask questions. But um, we will reconvene. Okay, it looks like everybody has been is back forcibly. So <laughs> Okay. Well, again, to to thank everyone for their participation today. Um all of the presentations were excellent. And it's just to me great that we have all of these students doing wonderful research. So thank you to all of the participants for taking the time.
Thank you for sharing the things that you're working on and your enthusiasm for what you're working on. And thank you to all of the faculty and graduate student mentors of these students. And I heard Ruth say that faculty are really good at identifying um, students in their classes. And I wanna commend all of you for doing that and for the students to, to stepping up and agreeing to, to come along and, and work in these labs. Uh, the judges said that it was a very hard decision to make. So, and, and I agree, but I appreciate, thank you to the judges for taking the time to, to evaluate these, these talks. So for third, we have Adrian Pavic. Yay, Adrian. Um, in second, we have Catherine West. Yay, <laughs> Catherine. And for uh, first place, we have Jocelyn Castillo. So all three of, of the winners, we have um, bio swag for you. Uh, you can come by the, the main office and pick it up or tomorrow we are having our senior reception at two o'clock and you're welcome to come by then because I will be announcing the winners again there. So you can pick up your certificate and your, your prize at that point in time or anytime the office is open, we're happy to provide it for you. So again, thank you to everybody, the audience, the students, the mentors. Thanks judges and organizers, well done. So impressed, yeah. Thank you, I was so glad everyone actually participated and yeah. uh, couldn't have done it without the grad students because uh, they really put everything together. <laughs> they helped yeah. a lot. Great yeah. job, guys. Yeah, I think this is an awesome, it's great. Yeah, I, I mean, this year the undergraduate symposium was kind of weird. And I mean, because of the virtual thing, but this takes time, but I think it's kind of nice to wrap up people. And like, I knew there were so many undergrads in the department, we just never get to hear from them, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you all for having your students present. I, it was, uh, yeah, wouldn't be possible without you. Okay, see you all tomorrow, maybe. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.